As we finish Faraday's law, we can now understand and explain and work with another type of circuit component called inductors. They work very similar to capacitor in a way in the end, and we'll see how that works out. But for now, this question kind of just introduces the idea and how inductors have inductance, similar to how capacitor have capacitance and resistors have resistance. But what exactly are we talking about? Usually, actually, the form of an inductor is a shape you're already very familiar with. It usually comes in the form of some kind of solenoid. Now, the thing with the solenoid is, as you put current through it, you're going to create some magnetic field, yes? Say that way. I, we didn't draw in exactly how the coil winds about, but the idea is we know that a current through a wire creates a magnetic field. But at the same time, this magnetic field is enclosed by the coil that creates it. So then there is some kind of magnetic flux in there. And this magnetic flux, if it changes over time, we know that through Faraday's law, it's going to create some kind of EMF. In fact, because of Lenz's law, this negative sign here, we know it's going to create some kind of back EMF, which actually will give you some kind of drop in voltage in terms of a circuit component. And to describe and relate how much voltage drop goes through that inductor, we define this quantity called inductance, which relates the flux through that particular component to the current that creates it. And you'll see in a second why that is useful. And the thing that relates them, that's inductance. And because I is used up for current already, Inductance has a symbol L, and in terms of the units, we call it in terms of Henry's, which is H, which basically is whatever unit that needs to be for us to get from current in amps to a Weber, which of course a Weber is the unit for magnetic flux, Tesla meter square. The purpose of talking about this thing called inductance it's in many sense very similar to when we dealt with capacitance and we notice that if you have parallel plates they're going to get some kind of voltage difference potential difference based on the charge that's on it so if we divide away the charge we have this number which purely depends on the geometry of the device which should be constant as you change in different charge this is kind of similar idea that somehow we know that the flux through that thing should increase as the current increases. And so if we capture every other parameter that's related to geometry that doesn't change with current, we can then make the problem a little bit easier. And presumably for most inductors, they're built so that the construction of the component doesn't change over time. So the area is not changing and it makes things a little neater. To make our final definition even easier, there's one little caveat that I have to put in here. This flux here, we also want to include the number of loops in this geometry bit so that we're going to define my flux a little bit differently. This is actually the total flux, which you might understand as the number of loops times the flux through each loop. So in that sense, this flux term is not just the flux through a particular loop, but we have everything captured inside. So just the definition is a little bit different than before. In any case, let's keep on going to see why the heck we care. So the thing now, going back to Faraday's law, is we have this. And basically what we've done is we've shoved the N inside this flux term now so that the thing becomes a little more simple dv as the voltage drop we're going to say that put that negative there of the flux which we have defined to be l times i and because we've said that this does not change over time that can come out and so for a solenoid because of the way as we increase the current as we change the current that changes the flux inside the coil which in turn creates an EMF that opposes that change, Lenz's law. 
which then affects the rest of the circuits. That's the idea behind the inductor in the sense that it resists changes in current. This compares again very well to say in a capacitor we have Q over C where your charge is really the integral of the current. So instead of the derivative of the current, it's the integral of the current that matters here. But effectively, what a capacitor does is that it resists changes in voltage. Because once a capacitor has a certain charge and you disconnect that the source voltage, it provides the voltage to resist that change. And you've seen that when you connect a capacitor in parallel in your power supply that the capacitor tends to smooth out any variation in the input voltage. Now, a more obvious way to think about what the capacitor does is you can say that a capacitor stores energy in electric fields. So then the flip side is an inductor also stores some kind of energy so that it can maintain that current when you try to remove it. But instead of storing it in electric fields, it's actually storing it in magnetic fields. As that current flows through that solenoid, it creates that magnetic field and magnetic flux, which then, as it dissipates, Lenz's law gives you the current to resist that change. So in many respects, the inductor and the capacitor, they're like two sides of the same coin. Lots of complementary things going on here. And you can think of one is resisting changes in current, while one is resisting changes in voltage. And that has different repercussion in terms of how it behaves in the circuit, how it affects signals and AC power and things like that. But before getting into that, let's just finish this particular question. In this case, they've given us a whole lot of information. So let's look back at the question real quick. They're saying that we're already given some kind of EMF. And like I said, it's a coil. It changes uniformly. So the current changes uniformly. So we have a delta I over delta T. So really, you know, all the theory aside, this is just a very straightforward plugging in and practicing the governing equation for the inductor, which is this guy here. What we're given is we have a delta V, the EMF induced is 0 0.4 volts. And then the di dt, because it's a uniform increase, we can use delta I over delta T, which is your final current minus the initial current all over your change in time, which gives you some number. And so to find out that inductance, in this case, the inductance, it's always going to be positive. They said induce EMF, they didn't tell us which direction, and we know it's going to be opposite. That's where the negative sign comes from. But we're just going to take this and drop the negative sign. And so we have 0 0.4 volts divided by this change in voltage over time. And then we get 0 0.24 Henry's. You can track through all the units, but really, as long as you use volts, amps, second, you will get Henry's. So this is a kind of introduction to these components we call inductors. They're just really coils. But then the way the magnetic field behaves through Faraday's law derives into this governing equation for them, similar to how you know resistor has a certain governing equation, delta V equals I times R, and capacitor has a certain governing equation, and this is the one for the inductors.